I like to tell you so the the problem we we looked at percolation and uh, some interpretation of what it means to have renormalization for it. The other thing which we li I like to do is to, sh to talk about the conformal field theory of it, which is a, a slightly more involved. So imagine that I have on the complex plane some percolating cluster. Then I choose a domain on the plane <coughs> and I ask a simple question. What is the probability that this cluster enters in a in an arc and lives in another arc. So if I name these points A, B, C, D, I can take this out of the percolating cluster. So I can I have a I have a domain like that an arc here and another arc here. What is the probability that this happens? This is called a crossing probability. In fact, for any, any random process, you can define it. We are interested in the case of percolation. Just, it is just because we are now focused on percolation, I, I like to ask what is the probability that this happens. In fact, one of the exercises I have given you is a similar problem in the exercise sheet that you do by simulation. So the way I organize this is control the boundary conditions. So if I, let's suppose the percolation cluster is black. So if I make this arc all white, and I make this arc all white, and I make this black, and I make this black. In fact, now the percolating cluster doesn't have a choice other than to start here and live from there. In the exercise, I simplified it to start at a point and live at a point. But in general, you can make it more a, a little wider, that is, it can start on any point here and live through any point there. I can, in fact, because of the Riemann mapping theorem, change that into any shape I like. So I should be able to map this to any shape I like, any, any old shape, with just four points. And it shouldn't make a difference. So 
What I therefore need is to have a method of controlling the boundary condition to get the answer. It's only the boundary which is fixing the answer. The shape is not. The geometrical shape, its volume is not. It's just the, the four points because you can, in fact, by a conformer mapping shape, map it into anything you like. So at this point, I need to insert something which I claim that it is some operator phi of zi. And what phi of zA does that at a, at zA, it changes the boundary condition. I, in fact, I have just two boundary conditions. It can either be white or black. So if I start with this segment being black, then acting with this operator at phi of z will change it into white. Then again, I act with phi of z d And it changes the boundary condition here, again at C, and finally at B. So it's these, it's essentially these four operators, which when they you put in there, if you can construct and recognize these four operators, um, it will it will create the setting for this entity. But I need a number because it's a probability. So I claim that this expectation value is this crossing probability. And these have to be operators from some field theory. And as you can guess, these are operators from conformal field theory with charge equal to zero. Charge equal to zero because we know from reasons I haven't told you that this is the percolation theory. So the crossing probability for a percolating cluster to come in and live like this is given by this four-point function. And we had a calculation for four-point functions, so I can simply insert it from there. So this probability P will be This is the cross ratio of these particular four points, and this is the hypergeometric function. If you remember, we went through a symmetry calculation showing that this cannot have any other shape than this shape. Um, I have, of course, forgotten some terms here.
Yes. Particle, no. I have a, I have a percolating cluster. Percolating cluster is in the percolation problem. You turn the squares on and off, and it forms a cluster. No, in percolation problem. Percolation problem. You turn them on and off. And you look if a cluster goes from bottom to top. Even that happens, you are at the critical point, the percolating cluster. And then you say, okay, I take this, I take this, I take this circle and I throw it on the complex plane. What is the probability that the percolating cluster comes in and goes out of this circle? Then you make it a little bit harder. What is the probability that it comes in in this arc and goes out through that arc? Yes? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Could you explain why the probability is given by this for one function? Um, this I cannot do. <laughs> It's a, I have to go through a lot of conformal field theory to tell you exactly why this happens, that this is true. Just let's accept that it's given by this four-point function. Um, this, this probability, we make some observations. This probability has to be conformally invariant. That it is conformally invariant is the case. Because if you make a conformal transformation, uh, you can take this domain to any shape you like. It should not change. So it has to be a conformally invariant quantity. It must depend on these four points. So it does. So this is a K quantity which is conformally invariant and is just function of the points and not their geometrical relation to each other. Yes. This is the uh, hypergeometric function f21, which is a solution of hypergeometric equation, and eta is this cross ratio. If you remember. When I did this calculation for four-point function of any conformal field theory, I got that it has some power law dependence and the function dependence. The function dependence at that time I did not specify. I just left this as a general undetermined function, f of eta. But now for this a specific problem, because it is the, the standard classical percolation, I can specify it because I now know that it has to correspond to central charge equal to zero. So there are pieces of information which I cannot give. One is, why is percolation related to C equal to zero? And how do you exactly prove this? However, we can do a neat trick. Take this and take it into a triangle. Triangle of side one. So where are my four points? A, B, C, and D. So 
So the problem now becomes percolating cluster coming up and leaving here. So these, are, these points are again where the boundary condition changing operator is acting. So these phi's are now acting on the four points A, B, C, and D on one of the sides. And I choose the sides at exactly distance one. So it's an equilateral triangle with side one. What this does is that uh, it simplifies this relationship a lot. Because everywhere you put one and these things all disappear. So now it's obvious that the probability of exit is just this distance. So P has to equal X. Rotationally the same. I mean, the C should be the place. A, B, C, D. Okay. You are right. Now, why is the probability exactly equal to X? Because if a percolating cluster comes in here and this side is black, and this side is white, it has no choice other than to go out that side. But on this side, I've made this part equal to white. So it only has a choice of going out through this window. Hence, the length of this window will determine the probability of it. If I make the window as big as the side D, it will certainly go out somewhere. So the probability becomes 1. It's, a, it's a, a statement about percolation which has been tested numerically many times and it is a strange that it's true, but it is true. Yes? So we get this triangle, do we get this by conformal mapping from this circle? There is a conform, yes. Do you get that by conform? Allowed by Riemann's theorem? I mean, since in the circle, I mean, there are no some sharp No, you the, there is no problem with sharp points on the boundary. It's, uh, in fact, uh, there is a general theorem which says that you can do that. And you, you actually, in complex analysis, can take a boundary with a smooth arcs to one with points, a polygon. You cannot break the boundary. If you are deaf, that's what I mean. You cannot break the boundary, but you can make it sharp like this, make put points on. See, I can. I, it's true that I have I drew these shapes, but essentially the the percolation comes in through the whole side, and the I, the option of going out the same side is not available. It all, it has to go out through this window which I give it. So you, you can also imagine it here like that. In fact, a percolating cluster
coming in here, going out there. No, then you do it is no. It's this the idea is that you have a percolating class and you throw this triangle on it. So it is possible that you have this situation. You have this situation, don't you? So the probability of doing it hitting this side. Plus the probability of, uh, sorry, I, I understand what you mean. I should not have said white here. Um, yeah. Okay, it's not obvious that it has to be X, but it is. It's, uh, there is the transformation which takes this into that, has the effect that takes this uh, hypergeometric function into just X. To go into the conformal field here of percolation, you have to admit a lot of difficulties. But we saw that just like Ising, percolation has a renormalization group. And it has a CFT representation. Yes. Um, maybe you should modify this class ratio. Modify by what? You should modify this class ratio. How? It's not it's like uh, you should uh, multiply uh, another parenthesis that with is that of C minus that of D and in the denominator the parenthesis. What is missing? Uh, you should uh, multiply in the numerator dot of C minus dot of D. And this and dot of D should be dot of A. Okay, the cross ratio is has some rules that okay, it's not correct. Yes. The probability does not change under conformal and terms. And this is an assumption or is proven? No, we accept that percolation at the critical point is conformally invariant. Ah, okay. okay. It is critical percolation. It's not, okay, okay. it's not under. So it is conformally invariant. So if you ask a question about it, the answer should be conformally invariant. And the answer in this, when I ask this sort of question, is where are the points, um, where are the four points? The only thing that matters is the position of these four points with respect to each other. So intuitively, if I uh, make as, as, as a, for example, the segment A B larger, yes. the other one becomes uh, smaller, so yes. Yes, exactly. 
or you can, it, it doesn't matter if you make this domain, if you change this domain by this shape. The four points are in the same place, but the arcs change. But still, you get the same answer. That point is true. As I said to you yesterday, I, I know this problem. It's, it doesn't have an obvious answer. If it has, I don't know it. You are right. The details of the lattice should not matter, especially when I'm at a critical point. Um, there is something missing there. I, I cannot quite get hold of it. So obviously, this sort of problem will not depend on the shape of the lattice. Because what is the lattice is changing is just the critical percolation value. And that is not, a, that is not an invariant property. For instance, if in the critical temperature, you, you can change things which changes the critical temperature but does not change the exponents. And for this one, I mean, the probability to cross the circle, is it the same as the probability to cross the triangle? Yes. So I can imagine that I can patch together many circles, and in the end, I'll form a big cluster. Similarly, I can do in case of triangles, and I might expect the same kind of threshold probability in both the cases. Then the PC is turning out to be same from this argument for both different kinds of Yes, I'm not sure. I don't know with that sort of an argument if you can change the value of PC. And you may be able to, but I haven't thought about it. Hmm? Yes? Probability of crossing, yes. But in that case, you say P is equal, is equal to X, X. But with a conformal transformation, I could move uh, the point C in the segment BD. Yes. Not forbidden. So I could modify the probability. Yes. That's true. So it's not. Uh, uh, you, sorry, but you, you, when you change X, if you change C and bring it here, you can take C and bring it here. Yeah. But then that is not conform. You cannot change that by conformal transformation to itself. You cannot do this by conformal transformation. Okay. You have you know, that. There you are changing something about the physics of it. In, in the same sense that here I can add this arc. But if I move, if I decide to move this point here, this is not a conformal transformation. It is, it is changing the definition of the problem. Mm -hmm. So it is not a conformal transformation? No, I don't think so. It, it is, you know, in a sense, it's obvious it's not. Because if you change it, the, the cross ratio will change. Whereas the cross ratio is supposed to be invariant. Okay. So I'm going to uh, stop here and uh, start a new, a new chapter in the in this course, and that is to look at Shamlovner evolution. 
So the next two lectures, that is this lecture and tomorrow, I will spend on SLE and then I will stop. On Thursday, I will just, I will use Thursday as a day to solve problems. No new topic. So, so that as much as I can get this in to today and tomorrow is my luck. <laughs> um, so, this guy, Shramlovner evolution, usually in the literature referred to as SLE kappa, is a very powerful for analyzing critical curves. Um, when I say critical curves, I mean curves which are scale-free paths. And these happen at the point of, uh, at the point of critical phenomena when two different phases meet. Also critical paths, as I said in the beginning of my lectures, appear when you have random, random paths, such as the self-avoiding walk. So, um, in fact, I have by this method a way of producing many critical paths by just changing kappa. So I change kappa, kappa when I have kappa equal to two, I generate loop raised random walk. When kappa is eight thirds, I generate a self avoiding walk. For kappa equal to three, I generate the Ising interface, critical Ising interface. Another path which is called harmonic explorer comes out at kappa equal to four. Percolation comes out at kappa equal to six and the uniform spanning tree at kappa equal to eight. And perhaps it's not, these are not all of them. There are other paths as well. Some which I know fall out of this range and some maybe have not yet been discovered. So it offers me a very powerful tool to discussed. And therefore, a, a methodology on the complex plane is necessary to deal with it. And then the methodology is a very, a very a strange way, if you like, or innovative way to look at a path on the complex plane. So usually, we are used to referring to a, to a path on the complex plane by its tip. So gamma of t is a complex number, and it starts at some point on the real axis, hence gamma of 0 is equal to a, and it goes up, and from t onwards it can also continue. This is the usual way to think about it. However, what Lovner suggested was doing this. He said, let us find a, a mapping of the complex plane to itself. such that this random path is, comes down and is absorbed in the real axis. What is meant by the hull here is any region of the upper complex plane that the motion of the path has restricted. Restricted in the sense that it is no longer available to the path. So I have such a map which absorbs the path into the real axis. This means that it has to change with time. 
because with time the path changes. So for each value of t, I will have a different func complex function which absorbs the path and the areas which it has not, which it has made inaccessible to itself. Therefore, g of zero of z is z. Why? Because the path has not, has not existed yet. So the only map you need here is the identity. Just maps it to itself. It is possible that the path gamma comes and touches the x-axis as it has done here. Not a very good drawing. It looks like it has crossed it, but it really just touched it. <laughs> it is allowed to touch the real axis and then continue again. Again, now you see a hull has been formed, which is a bit more complex than the previous hull. But still, it is something which is not accessible to gamma. That is, this path cannot go back in there. The hull kappa is now something bigger and more complex. And it's not just the path, but some areas of the complex plane which have been excluded by the motion of the path. What Lovner succeeded in proving was that for even for these sort of situations, there is a map which absorbs all of that into the real axis. So this map GZ of T it still exists even for this kind of a hull. We also put in some more, uh, some more conditions on GT of Z and then it, it becomes unique. The other condition we put uh, on GT of Z is that at infinity, at infinity complex plane is essentially the identity. So it has a Laurent expansion at infinity starting with Z, meaning that I absorb this, this kappa, this K into the real axis, but if you go far away from real axis, I don't do anything. The infinity is left alone. All this would not be much fun if finding G would be very difficult. However, it's not. T is time, yes. Well, it's actually, I call it time, but it's actually not time. It is a, a real number which counts along the path. T can be finite for Z infinity. T by Z. T over Z can be finite for Z in the um, It can be. So for that, T has to be infinite. So we are always looking at this at finite T, but very large T. So the point is that at finite T, the infinity is left untouched. Okay, if this differential equation didn't exist, it would be a waste of time talking about G because finding G would be very difficult. The genius of Lovner is that all that is explained, you can just solve this differential equation and the answer does all that you want. Very, very powerful result. It's an amazing result. So this equation says that I solve this differential equation with the boundary condition G0 of Z is Z, and G at infinity has that expansion. 
So the answer is com comes out unique for any given a of t. A of t is called the driving function. You give me a, I calculate g for you by solving this differential equation. So I need to go back to this, to my standard understanding of what a path is. Because my standard understanding of a path is this guy, gamma of t. What Lovner is saying is that, in fact, this gamma of t is, by g of t, is brought back into the real axis. Or there is another way you can look at it. You start at origin and you apply g of t slowly, step by step, and you build your path. So which is the other expression below. And in this way, I have a method of describing paths on the complex plane. The last equation is, is a formal writing. So g of t is applied to 0 for a small t. Then you repeat for the next year, uh, go epsilon ahead in t and then repeat g of t. So it's really, I should have, uh, it's, it's really should, is something like this. g of delta t on origin and then g of 2 delta t on this and so on. Okay, let's do a very simple example to understand what is going on. So, I take a point, I take a constant value for A. And that gives me a differential equation which is relatively easy to solve. So I see I have a factor wrong there, 2 times t minus b. No, um, no, sorry. I think that it has a 2 here, and that's where that 2 is coming from. So solve this to get that shape. <coughs> However, I know that if I set t equals to 0, I should get a z. And t equal to 0, b determines the value of t at 0. So I, I have made a shift in time. Um, so this is easily solved to get this formula. So the final answer is this guy. gt of z is a very simple function of t and z. And of course, it's simple because the driving function was taken a constant. Um, I can expand it near z equal to infinity. I get the right asymptotic behavior. And uh, at t equals to 0, I take the positive square root. A is cancel, and gt of 0, z is just z. So 
So this is a solution, an algebraic or a solution to the differential equation. But what is it geometrically? Yes? In the what? In the assignment. Yes, yes, yes. So this particular equation. Uh. Okay. Uh. <laughs> in the exercises, in the homework, as you say, I asked you to solve it for a driving function which you like. No, there is no partial differential equation to solve. This is just a, a, an exact uh, differential equation to solve. But for the constant, it's easy. For any other function, you may have to do it numerically. Or you can maybe, in a clever way, find a, an analytic function other than the constant, which you can solve by hand. So, what is it? What is it geometrically? This solution. What is? What does it do? It's a. It's a path, which starts at a and just goes up, just goes up. So gamma of t. Is is at any point at the position a plus i b. A is fixed, B is two root T. Just goes up. And as I said, gamma of T is the action of inverse of G on A, which has an obvious reason. It's because at this point, Lovner's equation becomes singular on the right hand side. So at the point where g equals to a, you have singularity. So that is that singularity is the tip of your path, gamma of t. Hence, the tip of the path is at g minus one of a. Where is the rest of the path? So when g acts on this on this function, on this complex plane, what it does is that it takes gamma of t to a on the real axis. It's obvious from here. g of gamma is a. What, what, where does it take a to? It takes it to some point further back. So it's actually taken, what it has done is that it has taken this path and absorbed it into the real axis. Relatively easy to believe, very difficult to believe when you have a complex stochastic process. But for this simple segment map, it is easy to, to believe what is happening. Hence, we can do a little algebra and see that the origin is actually gone here. In, in other words, there is some point back here which is acting as the origin. Now, as correctly pointed out, this is the exercise. Two functions. One is the sine of t and the other is t sine t. You put it in there and see what sort of Lovner paths you get. It is uh, interesting paths come out. But they have the property that they don't touch. The path does not touch itself. It's a, in other words, it's a simple path. It does not, sorry, cross itself. I shouldn't say touch. It does not cross itself. It is a simple path. There is no point of crossing. And as you choose different functions, you will see that it has no point of crossing. 
Now that was Lovner 1924. Then we time translate forward to 2000. Schramm made an observation that if you put in, instead of the driving function, a Brownian motion, you get something interesting. When you put in a Brownian motion, you no longer get just a simple, just a, just a path. You get a collection of paths. You get a collection of paths which are stochastically or generated. So he said, put Brownian motion instead of A. And of course, this is Brownian motion no, uh, with variance equal to 1. So I put a square root of kappa to get any variance I like. And now the question is, what do I get? I get random paths like that, starting at a point on the real axis. Usually, we take it to be the origin, and it goes up. These paths are random paths which don't cross themselves, but it's not a self-avoiding path. Self-avoiding random walk is in this class of paths, but it's not, you know, not, not all of them are that kind. It's a concept which, uh, at least for me, was a little, took me a while to digest. It is a path. It is random. It doesn't cross itself, but it's not a self-avoiding random walk. It can be for a special value of kappa, but in general, it is not. It is statistically different. It is statistically different. The only similarity is that it doesn't cross itself. So in this way, I can generate a lot of paths which are not self-crossing, and they are random. Hence, it's a very good candidate for critical curves and, or interfaces of interfaces, random interfaces. <coughs> so here is, I could have given this as an exercise as well, but I thought it is harder. Just put in different values of kappa and see what you get. So for different values of kappa, for equal to 1, 3, and 6, these are the paths you get. So we notice that there is an obvious qualitative difference between here and there. And I will argue that kappa is smaller than 4, which is here, and kappa is bigger than 4, which is here, are qualitatively different. We will get to that point. OK, just a slide about Brownian motion. In case there is someone in the class who doesn't know what is a Brownian motion, Brownian motion is a, a stochastic process which has following properties. It's continuous. Its increments are independent random variables. And in fact, these increments have a Gaussian distribution. There are these Bt and Bt plus H are normally distributed. It has the property that this property distribution function is a solution of the diffusion equation. Hence, it is conformally invariant. <laughs> in other words, if you take a Brownian path in a domain and you map it to another domain, and hence a phi of gamma, and phi is conformal, again, phi of gamma will be Brownian. In physics literature, it, we are used to describe its distribution by this path integral. 
Uh, strictly speaking, it's a wrong thing to do because B is not differentiable, it's just continuous. But uh, like many other things we do in physics, we do it this. And uh, maybe in this representation, it's easier to see that now any mapping of B by a map by a conformal map will give us another Brownian distribution. <coughs> However, Brownian motion is allowed to repeatedly cross itself. It's the motion of a Brownian particle, and if you've ever seen it under a microscope, it continually crosses itself. SLE doesn't. When it goes inside the, the Lovner equation, the produced path does not cross itself anymore. So B of T as a candidate for critical curves, although it is conformally invariant, is a bad candidate because we cannot have self-crossing in interfaces, critical interfaces. We are dealing with two dimensions and it's very important to note this property of Brownian motion that it is recurrent it repeatedly comes back to the origin. And that is going to play a very important role. That's things, they are. Why they are? Because they are uh, a scale invariant as they should be, and they are not self-crossing as they should be. This is the property that interfaces have. Now the contribution made by Schramm, uh, I should say that he actually called his, in his paper called this a stochastic Lovner evolution, but it was this S and this S are in the right places, so now we call it the Schramm Lovner evolution. Yes? Sorry, but um, if we want to, to construct such a curves, uh, we need such complex uh, uh, construction. Yes. And then we see that it really, the final line uh, reproduces quite well the, the boundaries the of interface, critical yeah. domains. Yeah. But these things, in the sense, the, the complex con construction that we built for, to obtain these curves are physically related to the problem, or, or it's just by chance that the, Finally, we, we constructed such complex lines. We saw that by chance they reproduce the boundaries, or there's, there is a deeper connection between the construction, the physical, the physical properties of the. In a, there is a deeper connection, and you are jumping this presentation a little. There is a deeper connection, but still, you could say that even that deeper connection happened by chance. Okay. Um, I don't know how much Schramm knew that this connection is going to be made. He, he just observed that these are conformally invariant distributions. The observation which was made later, and I'm not sure who made it, maybe Carr did it, was that the theory of these curves is related to conformal field theory. And since conformal field theory is related to critical phenomena in two dimensions, there must be a relation between these guys and critical phenomena. However, this connection is not complete. I, I mean, not all critical phenomena can be described in this way, just some of them. And the connection to conformal field theory is obscured. That means not 
all quantities of conformal field theory can be explained in terms of this, just some. But one of the things which we are interested in, which is the, the fractal dimension of these curves, comes out to have very easy expression. So the, the fact is that they have in common the scaling invariance. They have in common the scaling invariance, so this, this common feature connects them up. Okay, so Sharam claimed that they have two properties. One is the Markov property. The Markov property says that if you have a domain like this and you have an SLE path going from R1 to R2, you choose a point on the middle, Tor. Then you make a two-step calculation. You first do a SLE mapping, bring Tor to the edge. Then it is true that if, if you take this gamma 1 and you first absorb gamma 1 into the edge, then gamma Tor to gamma 2 is again conformally invariant. So that whether it goes from Tor to gamma 2 is independent of how it came to Tor. So this is the Markov property that these paths have. And the other one is, of course, the conformal invariance of it. That is, if you take a distribution over a domain of paths which connect R1 and R2, and you make a conformal mapping, it changes the domain to D prime, changes the path to phi of gamma, and it changes the points to phi of R1, phi of R2, which are written as R1 prime, R2 prime the probability does not change. So this is in shapes, what I just said. Conformal invariance means that you make a mapping with these two endpoints and the path connecting them from D to D prime, and you get new points and a new path and a new domain the probability distribution over the new domain is the same as the old domain. So this is the hull which I already explained that as the path moves out of the real axis, as it comes out here, it takes some parts of the complex plane which are, not, which are then not available to it. And obviously what is available to it is what is left out. I didn't make this obvious. In this theory, because of the way we set up the differential equation and so on, we specifically work with the upper complex plane. And it's, of course, arbitrary. I just need to define a real axis, and then everything works above it. OK, now let's take the, let's take the Lovner equation and make a transformation on it. And that is define a new function, which we have called f here. Um, Put, in, put it in Lovner's equation, we get something simpler, which is this guy. What I now have here is the time derivative of the Brownian motion, therefore this is a white noise. So I have now a Langevin equation with a drift force and a white force, white noise force. And we know how to solve these differential equations in physics. This particular one is called the Bessel process, which is, by the way, very useful in financial mathematics. 
it has been used for a long time in financial mathematics. But for us, uh, for us, I mean people who don't do finance, <laughs> what is important in it is that it has a drift force, which is 1 over f. So actually, a 1 over f force derives the particle away from the origin. If this was not here, I would just have a Brownian motion. F would be just a Brownian motion. And the Brownian motion has the property that it plays around the origin. So the Bessel process we know in physics is the balance of between these two forces, the, the deterministic drift pushing it away from the origin, the stochastic force bringing it back. So let's take these two steps separately. I can assume this to be zero. So I set k equal, kappa equal to zero. Sorry, I, here I have done it the other way around. First, I ignore this guy. Hmm? Yeah, I ignore this guy, that's true. So, f is squared, d by dt, one half is equal to two. Therefore, f squared is 4 dt. That kappa there is unnecessary. I mean, it is a, it's just a force of habit. When I write a diffusion equation, I just automatically put a constant here. I don't need it. So what does this say? This is that you have uh, a path which is going to infinity like a square root of t. And this is what I expected with this uh, repulsive force. Just goes to infinity like a square root of t. Alternatively, I can forget about that and so this and that will give me a, a force which comes back. So question is, when do these two forces equal each other? Of course you need a better proof, but the implication here is that there is a point for it exactly kappa equal to 4. Here I have a returning process and here I have a, a path going to infinity. And these two forces equalize exactly at kappa equal to 4. So three regions can be identified. One is for kappa equal to 4 so that we have a path which starts at origin, is a random path, and, and a simple path, and it goes up to infinity. Above 4, and above four, it's a path which can touch itself. It can touch the real axis, so it will cut out a hull, and it's a growing hull as gamma, as gamma of t goes up to infinity, the hull grows. Um, so uh, still the path goes towards infinity, but it, it, is a, it gives you a growing hull like that. 
Now there is, from somewhere else, I know that k at kappa equal to eight, it becomes a space filling path. That means that it visits every point on the space as it goes up. So essentially, I have three phases for SLE. Below four, which is this sort of random path, not touching itself. Exactly at four, which is a, a shape somewhat like that. And ab above four, but smaller than eight, which it becomes denser and denser here until it becomes totally dense. Okay. Another property of the path is that I can ask what happens if I scale time. A scaling in a space was accepted because we are at, we are at the critical point, so you know that a scale invariance in a space is needed. That is, a scaling in the z direction. However, you can ask what happens if I scale it in the t direction. t is the time variable. It goes along the path. And so if you scale it, you are actually going up or down in the path. The white noise has this scaling property that uh, if you scale it by a squared, a comes out. You can take that and show that the uh, Lovner process has to have this particular uh, scaling. That g, g has to scale by 1 over a when you scale time by a squared. And therefore, it follows that the hull will also scale with A like that. Yes. It doesn't matter. It's a function. So you define a new function as g minus a, and that goes in the denominator. It's, it's a very normal operation on a stochastic differential equations. That it is in the denominator does not play any important role. So another question which we can ask is the locality of it. Is the path local or it's, uh, it knows of its entire existence elsewhere? So. One a question is that, is it a random process which sort of takes this tip and then pushes it a little further, ignoring the rest of things which are on the complex plane? Or suppose I have a domain in the complex plane A, very far from my path, and my path at some point has been in there and has come out now and is continuing here. Is it, is there, what is the condition that this gamma does not know about A? If it knows about A, then it's a non-local entity. It knows about all its past as it moves up. You may want to say that some, for some physics processes, I like to have one which is 
blind to its past. I will jump the calculation and just give you the answer that uh, if kappa equals to C6, it will be a path which is local. It doesn't see its, its past. So it can, it, the, the tip of it just follows a Brownian motion. Only one value of kappa has the property that it is local. So locality requires kappa equal to six. Yes, there was a question. Say again. Yes. Yes. Now, do, I, I had some uh, slides to make this calculation, but uh, I had decided not to give you the mathematics of it. So to ask if the path knows about A, you look at the expected time to hit A. And then you do that a calculation on that, and you see that uh, if that expected time to hit A is uh, divergent, then it will never hit it, and it doesn't know about it. The alternative, the, the, the sort of dual question to that is that if, we, if I require the path to, visit, to not visit a fixed domain A in the upper half plane, a similar question is slightly different from not knowing where it is, and you would expect that these to be related. Again, some calculation. And the answer comes out that restriction requires kappa equal to 8 thirds. So you might guess that these two numbers are related. And in fact, you are right, because the SLE has a property called duality. And I want to see what duality means. So it take, a, take an SLE path, it is going up into, into infinity, it creates a hull, and then I can make a cover for the hull, which is this red path. In fact, this picture gives you the impression that my SLE path is the red line, which is actually not, it's the blue line. So there are, when you create, construct an SLE path, you have two dual paths. One is the covering of the other. And this happens only for kappa equal bigger than four because or smaller than four, you don't have such a process. If you look at this now, you see that this path, which is the cover of this other path, is, is an SLE which does not, which is not, touching itself. It's a rather simple SLE. And this is, in fact, the case. That uh, you, have, you have two pictures. One is an SLE path which is going to infinity, rather jagged and complex. And the other is the path which just traces out its perimeter, which is this path. And they have they are both SLE. This is an SLE. This is also an SLE. Uh, and their couples are related by this relationship. In, yeah. So can you clarify again what uh, the restriction is, what, what is about? 
the restriction, see, the, the restriction is that we want a path not to visit another part, a part of the complex plane, to just not go in there. It's different from the other one that it has a section of itself that it sees or does not see, that it moves independent of it or not. But here I have an area and I want this path never to go in there. Now this, the duality says that they are both SLE paths with kappa, kappa, kappa prime equal to 16. If you think of the phases of SLE, the minimum was two, the maximum was eight, so that minimum maximum are related by this relationship, two times eight being 16. The other way to look at it is that these two paths have fractal dimensions, and if you calculate their fractal dimensions and multiply them by each other, you get this relationship. What is amazing is that this relationship before SLE was known. So dH is the hull fractal dimension, DEP is the external perimeter fractal dimension. And for a critical phenomena, this was known. However, the explanation comes as these guys can be interpreted as SLEs. So this case, six times eight over three is also 16. That means that these two, these two paths, the locality and restriction are dual to each other. Okay, I can think of SLE as a, a stochastic process, and it is because I can write a Langevin equation for it. So I must also be able to write a Fokker Planck equation for it. So if epsi is the probability distribution function of SLE, it must satisfy this differential equation, which is the Fokker Planck equation for, for this, this guy here. Now, you, you look at this and you say, oh, I've seen this differential equation somewhere else. <coughs> and where have you seen it? It's the level two null vector which I gave you when I was telling you about null vectors, except that this coefficient is now given in terms of kappa. Hence, you suddenly observe that the PDF of SLE is, in fact, something which satisfies the level two null vector, and it's therefore an, a wave function or a distribution which you can get out of CFD, provided you fix this constant, kappa over four. Okay, we fix the constant kappa over four in front. Two amazing things happens. One is that you get the central charge of the CFD in terms of kappa. And the other is that you get the conformal weight of the field associated, the H21 field associated with this C, which is just six minus kappa over two kappa. This is a, this is in fact a very revealing thing, it is the question you asked a little sooner and getting here that this, there is really a deep connection because of this simple observation between CFT and SLE. So I can perhaps get a lot of calculations of SLE out of CFT by this, using this connection. Now this connection these expressions 
are interesting. Uh, one of them is this, that the C vanishes for kappa being six or being eight thirds, which are these dual pictures. The other one is that the H21 field has conformal weight equal to zero because at kappa equal to six. So when you are dealing with kappa equal to six, whatever it is, you have a zero field and zero central charge. But we know that is because half an hour ago I was telling you that percolation has C equals to zero and H21 equal to zero of the fields which I introduced. There is another property here which I wonder if I have given. It's not obvious, but this expression for the central charge is invariant under this transformation. So if you change kappa to 16 over kappa, C does not change. So I can now just make a table of the central charge and kappa. And for each central charge, of course, I have a, a statistical physics model, which I can write next to it. And now I expect this to be related to this SLE. And these are very famous models. The looper is random walk corresponds to kappa equal to two, self-avoiding walk, or KPZ level sets to eight thirds, a spin cluster boundaries in the uh, Ising model, or WO3 level sets, this is tungsten oxide. Double dimer model, harmonic explorer, level sets of the Gaussian free field, they all correspond to central charge one, on kappa equal to four. FK clusters, Ising model, but FK clusters corresponds to 16 over three. Percolation cluster boundaries corresponds to six. And it so happens that 2D turbulence also corresponds to kappa equal to six. And finally, the uniform spanning trees which fill out the space as you know, are related to the sandpile model and shortest distance on the UST of sandpile model is the Luperace random walk. So this is the other limit where kappa is eight. So these two theories are dual by this understanding. This third column is still something I have to do. That is in terms of this knowledge that I have, I can construct the fractal dimension of these curves. Only one which is obvious is this UST at the very end, uniform spanning trees. And it's because they are a space filling, they have the same fractal dimension as the ambient space. This is a two dimensional curve. These ones I have to show you how I, <coughs> how I derived. But I want to stop here. Thank you. Tomorrow will be the last part.